You're going to record me. Okay. I'm, I'm, I missed the step. So yeah. I, 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 I'm totally going to do that. <laughs> I'm not going to start over. So no, sorry. no, no, don't start over. It, I'll explain it in the blurb. That we yeah, yeah. Step, okay. So. All right. Yeah, I don't want to bore anybody. But anyway, so this is a, a Desert Gold by Zane Gray. Again, you know, she's fainted and like helpless. And anyway, don't really get that. So this is what we know about or what, what we've been told about women in the early West. So we're also, we've also been told that if we're not those things, if we're not maternal and helpless, we're sort of crazy, we need to be controlled, we're wild. And again, we're, we're seeing this in all of the uh, pulps that, you know, we're getting in both the magazines and the books and the movies, right? Again, women have dressed, you know, really tight clothes that wouldn't at all be practical in the West. Um, and the, the mythology is still being perpetuated today. These are more modern uh, takes. And if you if you see the center one, saving the mail order bride and the, a hero to her rescue, I mean, it's you just it's in the title, right? California didn't particularly have a big mail order bride business. Um, uh, but also you see News of the World, um, the same narrative, you got the young girl who needs saving uh, from the Indians by the white male. Um, and then that was it was based on a book. So uh, let's contextualize what was happening in history at the time. So in 1850, in the rest of America, husbands had total control over women, the first, their, you know, their daughters, then if they were married, uh, their wives, married women had no rights under English common law. Everything a married woman had could be bought or sold by her husband. She did not um, have any rights once she got married. She couldn't divorce. And if she left, she could not take her children with her. So this is contextualizing what was actually happening in America. What was actually happening in California? So something very, very different. In early California in 1850, in, uh, we had the California Constitutional Convention. One third of the delegates were Californios and two thirds were American immigrants. And those Californios really cared about the rights that women already had in their family. So the, they basically pushed to put in the California Constitution a set of laws. And this is, when the Americans came out to California, this is what was happening. The society was being built very fast. There was a surge of immigrants and this massive gender imbalance. It was about 20 to one in 1850, 20 men to one women. It technically was a free state with no slave labor. I say technically because in certain instances, Native Americans were still being enslaved. We, we had Spanish civil laws and rights for women based on the Spanish civil laws. So what were those? During the California Constitutional Convention, the Californios expressed that they valued women's rights. They valued their mothers, their sisters, their daughters, their wives to own property separate from them and to run businesses. And the, the men, the two thirds men that were Americans who had immigrated to California basically said, well, okay, we'll put it into the constitution because we wanna get women West. So it'll be the biggest magnet, right? To bring women West. If we put in our, cons in, in our state constitution that we will allow women to um, own businesses and we'll get them West. So that was the plan. Um, and, and that's something you also integrate into the novel too. That this uh, women can be prosperous on their own without a man, and that's what also a great part of the book as well. So you've taken oh, this real you. bits of history and you've woven it into the the narrative as the story. So right, this was the. I mean, I feel I feel I felt very much like when I was writing the novel, first when I was researching it and then I was writing it, I wanted to create an authentic narrative. Mm -hmm what was really happening with women, right? We weren't falling off horses and, you know, I mean, yes, there was a, there was, there were prostitutes, but there were far fewer prostitutes in California than one would be led to believe based on the narrative that has been given to us. Mm -hmm. So it's important to understand the, the historical context that women were arriving in. And then the women that I researched, it made, it made perfect sense to me all of a sudden, oh, I get it. These laws allowed women and encouraged them to have economic opportunity independence mm -hmm. so um should i shall i go on Wait, no keep going keep going <laughs> okay awesome just interrupt me anytime i'm good with that um so so what rights did we get we could sign contracts own property buy and sell property 
Um, that was in the constitution. And then very quickly after that, by county, we were given um, rights to divorce and keep custody of our children. And interestingly enough, I it happened very, very quickly, county by county, but it, it happened, right? That women could get divorced. And I think the main reason in my research that I, that I think that this was allowed was that I think men were like, well, maybe if she divorces that guy, she'll marry me. So they were sort of not promoting divorce, but certainly they weren't stopping it. And they were creating laws in each county to allow it. Well, especially if for a long time with the men coming, that they sort of started to outnumber the women. And a lot of the gold yeah. mining towns, a lot of the, um, the, mount, the you know, you know, the towns that are up in the mountains that didn't have a lot of women who, who did become these prosperous women who um, would become stars. <laughs> and they're, they're sprinkled throughout our history too, these, these very powerful women um, yes. that you, you've come across that, that were, right, right. helped to shape the, the state, so. Yes, right, and you know, cause you're from, you're Madeira. from one of these small <laughs> towns. Yeah. Long history in your family, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the myth versus reality. What was really happening with these women? These women, th these are some photographs of some women at the tur at in the 18, well, a little bit later, 1860s, 70s, turn of the century, and then some photographs from a little bit later. But mm -hmm. th these are all from California, and this is what really was happening. You've got women digging, you've got women panning, you've got women, you know, um, serving, you know, selling things in the mine. You see this woman in the center who has a basket of bread. Um, I love these pictures. Um, the one in the lower corner is fascinating to me because I believe that this, this is the women in the San Francisco Mint. And they were actually counting. And I was very surprised that women were in banking this early. Like I didn't, that kind of blew me away. I was very surprised by that. So California wasn't alone. I wanna just quickly, briefly talk about that. California began the movement of rights for women, but we weren't alone. All the other states started very quickly after giving women rights. And as a matter of fact, Wyoming, I think in 1867 or nine, was, gave women the right to vote, but long before California. 1869, yeah, I got that right. So California um, had full suffrage, in 1911, but you see many of these other Western states were also creating laws for women um, that were very favorable. So again, the narrative that I was showing earlier is totally not in line with what was happening with the laws that were affording women rights. Mm -hmm. So I'll talk about some of the women in my novel first um, for a moment now. So the, my main character, Elizabeth, is basically an amalgam of these four women that were real California women. Um, maybe you know some of them. Actually, can I ask my question now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Here, my little trivia question. question. Okay, so I don't know how many people are on, whether there's five or 10 or whatever, but basically, here's my question. So tell me an interesting woman from the West, just any interesting woman from the West. She doesn't have to be from California and she doesn't have to be real. She can be a not like a character from a novel or she can be a real woman, but there's only one rule. She cannot be a prostitute <laughs> or, or actually she cannot be like a crazy criminal type. So not prostitute, not crazy criminal. So just toss out some, you know, a woman and uh, the most interesting answer, I'll give away a copy of my novel, Prospects of a Woman. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. So, so you can use the Q&A or the chat or, or raise your hand if you have a, and um, I won't see it because I'm sharing my screen. So okay. yeah, I'll read, read it out to you if anybody's okay. so shy. Nobody's raising their hand. That's okay. We'll see <laughs> so many answers. You know, it oh, oh here, here, Barbara's raising her hand. So here, let, let me unmute you, Barbara. So. Okay, I'm racking my brain. And the only thing I can come up with, because I'm looking for a doctor and I'm looking for a politician. <laughs> yep, there's a lot of those all over the West. Yeah, shame on me, because I love this genre. Yeah. But the only thing I'm coming up with is Calamity Jane. Okay, not good. I'm not going to take that one. Yeah, Go I can't blame you. <laughs> okay. I'll keep thinking. Let me I'll tell you thinking. about some of these other women, and then okay. you can be thinking. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and yeah, this has to be in the 1800s, say? Before 1900. 
Before 1900, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll keep thinking. Okay. <laughs> uh, feel free to use the internet. Um, okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let me talk about some of the real women in California that inspired my novel. Um, so Frances Gearhart was a printmaker and a watercolorist. She did a very beautiful scenes of California nature. And Ina Coolbrith was, she was actually the first poet laureate ever in America or any poet laureate anywhere. Um, a really interesting, she was a librarian and um, I'm sure you know her. Um, I can't remember where, that's the problem. Uh, <laughs> Oakland, Oakland. Okay. <laughs> Oakland. Um, and then Mary Foote was an author and an illustrator and Josephine McCracken was a writer and journalist and environmental activist. And I believe that she was predominantly responsible for saving the Santa Cruz kind of redwoods because she did a lot of environmental writing and she was very, um, that area was very important to her. So so my character, I basically like took pieces of all of these different women and created a main character, Elizabeth Parker, who has kind of touches on a little bit of each of these things. So one of my characters is um, in my novel is actually based on a real woman. This, this woman here, Nancy Gooch, she was a, a real California woman who came in 1850. She was brought here by her Missouri slave owner. And as soon as the state uh, became, you know, as soon as we came into the Union as a state in 1850, in her town of Coloma, which is on the American River, uh, her slave owner was run out of town because it was an economic um, inequality that people weren't comfortable with having um, Native Americans or Hispanics or slaves dig for them. So everybody kind of had to dig for themselves. So when her slave owner was run out of Coloma, she ended up taking on laundry, um, because doing farming, and she ended up um, becoming one of the largest landowners on the American River. So she's a very impressive woman, and she's in my book. I slightly changed her last name. Um, Wanda Brionis, a lot of people know about her. She's a pretty powerful uh, ranching woman. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, she's in my novel. I also changed her name slightly. The interesting thing about her is she had so many kids. She was like a single mom of like, I don't even know, bazillion, eight or something. And her husband was pretty brutal to her. So she left him, continued ranching, you know, was very prosperous cattle rancher. So um, she's fascinating to me and is, I included her in my novel. And then this particular woman, she came later in California history in the 20s, the teens and 20s, she was doing photography, but I was so enamored with her that I had I included her as a character in my novel and I sort of pushed the narrative forward her name is different and she's Julie McRobb in my novel but she was fascinating because she would go in nature and take all of her clothes off and just kind of pose and do these like selfie almost pictures and they're very sort of dreamy and ethereal and I just I think she's an amazing artist so Anne Brigman. Um, so anyway, um, I want to just briefly mention some other books that are really um, doing a great job of shattering the myth of women in the West. Um, Outlawed and How Much of These Hills is Gold are both very modern books that are just so intriguing about um, gender and sexuality and uh, the Chinese American experience in California. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, if you guys are interested in this genre, I highly recommend these six books. I, th I think they're amazing. I won't go through them all, but write them down and um, check them out. Um, so uh, let's see, what, what else can I say? Um, I think it's important to realize that um, this romantic notion of sort of the men as saving women is, is kind of a fun, um, you know, a fun read. It's a romp, but I don't think it's real. It's not real based on all the research that I did. There are components of it that are real, mm -hmm. but for the most part, women in California had agency, we had power, we were running businesses, and we um, were helping build the West. So hopefully m m my book sort of expresses that a little bit. Yeah. Well, no, it, it, I think it does. It does. There's a lot of stuff, that, the history that you brought into it. One of the things that I really, you know, you forget about is how wild California was. Mm -hmm. And when you have the grizzly bear attack, um, people forget how many grizzlies were around. Yeah. You know, I got to tell you, I, can I just <laughs> tell you a really funny story? So 
right now there's a bear under my deck Oh man! <laughs> and I cannot, we can't roust him. So <laughs> he's been out there since this morning and he's like, they like to sleep during the day. So he's like curled up in there and my dog went out there and I was like, oh my God, she's going to get swiped. Anyway, we have so many bears where we are, but I'm really happy that we don't have grizzly bears. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because when you do a lot of research, you, you do see all these grizzly bear attacks, all these, um, the, it was, yeah, we, it was, we had a huge population of grizzlies. We had a huge population of elk. Um, yeah. it, there's, there were laws passed, like I remember reading about um, coyote roundups that they were giving um, hunters uh, payment for pelts. So the right. more pelts you brought in, and this is sort of how we sort of decimated our own natural wildlife with just, right. you know, hunting. Um, right. The beavers that were hunted at um, the uh, the sea otters mm -hmm. that you know we've decimated so much of the the environmental um, you know the wildlife, but when in back in the day because that was one thing I really because you you know about history read about it and then if you're out in nature nowadays we're not as um, endangered I guess for, to be a, you know attacked by a grizzly bear like she was yes. and that was it's frightening too because you also forget that. Guns back in those days still were the, all the kind you got to pour the um, yeah. <laughs> the powder yeah. and put the ball and you're like oh my yeah. in the middle of a bear attack I, you know <laughs> I do have to say I spend a lot of time outside and there's there's a lot to be concerned about so um, we we live on Lake Tahoe and there's a mountain beaver that is like prehistoric size like when he stands up he's taller than me and. I have a coyote vest for my dog because the dogs around here are always getting eaten by coyotes. And mm -hmm. um, we were, and I, we have mountain lions and um, kind of at the ridges. And so I was hiking there the other day. And, um, I was very concerned because my dog was freaking out. I'm like, oh, it's for sure a mountain lion. <laughs> so, and we see bobcats all the time. And I really love that. I feel like, um, you know, we we're more aware now, right, of taking care of nature mm -hmm. and the wildlife and I think that's great but I still don't miss the grizzly bear sorry yeah well no it's it was one of the most you know savage you know um <laughs> it'd come after you they're, they're, that was the really scary thing about yeah you think how major the population used to be in the state yeah um, I don't it, think I could uh would hike comfortably like I've been to Montana <laughs> And I did not hike comfortably. Like those are scary bears. The one mm -hmm. in the one under my deck right now, he's like so cute. And when my dog went out there, okay, he could definitely hurt my dog. I'm not, but when my dog went out there, he just kind of like, he didn't even like swat his paw. He just kind of looked and turned around and it was really funny. I know they're not gentle, but. No, no, the, yeah, any bear, especially wild bears, you want to be very careful. So. <laughs> yeah, but we can't get him out from under our deck. I have an air horn that we usually use, but it's out of air right now. Oh, no. <laughs> I, have to to the, I have to go to the hardware store and get more. So um, there, there's, there, I mean, where do I start? I mean, because there, you have a lot of, I, the one thing I really love too is that I, I love that you included the, the um, letters to Mary Louise. And right, you know, right. The, you, even when I first saw the, the name, I thought, oh, and then it was, it was Manny Selka. I love right, that right. you have this, but, you know, writing letters back home was a very, you know, part of, you know, coming West. And I love that you had, you included those little snippets in there um, because it's, it's just sort of helps to bring that back to life and how they're, you're still trying there. Elizabeth's still reaching out back to the West. I mean, she comes out to California trying to track down her father and you know and that the very beginning of the book and there's this um yeah there it just yeah it's really great I think you did a, good, a wonderful job oh thank you um, so much and I you can see why it won so many awards um I I love that the um the different parts of it but were there things that you left out that you thought would go that would take it to fiction that you wanted because I mean I really felt felt that you have wrapped a lot of the history um, not so much that you're overwhelmed by it, but enough to make you see that Elizabeth's comfortable. She's able to get to the point where she's prosperous to be, oh, uh, give away, but you know, that, uh, <laughs> that she's in a spot where she's moving along without the sort of barriers that you would think that, um, that could face a woman, especially a woman who didn't have rights um, to be able to do things on her own, to hire people, to, you know, have workers and that kind of stuff. So, right. But were yeah, there I mean, elements that you left out or are you, you um, know? That's an interesting question, Dar. Are there elements that I left out? 
Um, I think there's things, there's, there's components in literature of the West, which are typical, right? And they're very salacious. And oftentimes they have to do with violence against women or women mm -hmm. being in danger. And I think that's the most interesting question that I normally get from readers. And when I do presentations is, wasn't, wasn't she in danger? And, or, you know, why wasn't she raped, right? That, that's usually a question that I get. I'm like, okay, in all my research that I did, most, as you said earlier, most women, when they arrived into a town, they were prized and they were valued because there were so few women. They were, they were, there, there wasn't a lot of danger or um, possibility of danger against them because everybody was around sort of watching. And when I did my research, I did come upon one instance where a man was kind of holding his wife captive in this shack down on the American and he had her like tied up and, but they were married. And as soon as the town around there found out about it, they came down and they like rescued her. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's probably one of the things I left out because I, it's to me, it just didn't feel authentic in all the research that I did about the women in California, you know, your typical violence against women scene. I, it just didn't feel authentic to me. So I left that out, but also I used to write about technology, um, in my prior to writing this novel, I wrote in the Silicon Valley for 20 years and I, I, I could have written a lot more about mining technology because I'm super into it, but I, th I thought I would bore readers. So I tried to cut, you know, I tried to cut it short to keep moving the narrative along, but I could have written about mining technology all day long. Well, but I think that there's even the part where you talk about the smell of the town. And I, I think that was really like you captured that gold mining where the tent sort of cities would set up and how, you know, someone accidentally sets their, their tent on fire. And th that was always the big, one of the biggest fears of fire because for any kind of town, and it happened to a lot of gold mining towns that it, all it took was one, you know, careless person and you could burn an entire city to the ground and it happened a couple times um throughout the state's early history during the gold rush times but that just i i thought talking about that smells makes it so vivid to give you that the stink of how all these you know men who are unwashed people who are unwashed who are living in, in even though they're outside it just becomes a stinky mess and i love my, that chapter when you start the story I'm like oh my god you really just smell how stinky yeah, yeah. <laughs> little gold mining town must have been at that time too right so. yeah but also sort of the beauty of nature around it I mean you know being from your hometown in the mountains right it's mm -hmm. um it, there's just like a sweetness to the air like you can almost like feel it and I don't know I, I wanted to capture that in my book because um I just it's very precious to me, California nature. And so I hope that came across. No, it does. It, it, I think it, that, that you have that juxtaposition of where men in industry are starting to really harm the environment to, to do this impact of uh, what, ha especially with gold mining, especially the way it was being done too, with the panning. And, you know, it was just, you're constantly making this dirt, constantly stirring up the riverbed. I love the, the, um, which he, he, they discovered the elephant, which ends up being the quartz thing. I just, it was just a really beautiful <laughs> image of, of the rock and the, and the stone. I mean, it's just, that's what I'm saying. You did it. I thought you did a great job of capturing that beauty and the juxtaposition of what happens when people are there camping and, you know, making right. you home. So. Right. And kind of destroying the environment to get <laughs> at the gold, right? That's, that's a big, big part of it for me. Um, and also the fires, you're right. Like, I mean, I was evacuated last week. Um, I just came back. I was evacuated from the South Lake area. And for two weeks, two and a half weeks, I was out. But I know that people in Placerville and up off of 50, um, they were evacuated for like five weeks, much longer. And by the way, the fire is still burning. The Calderon mm -hmm. fire is still burning. It's, it's difficult, right? When these little fires get huge and yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think every, San Francisco had the great fire. I mean, the, the gold mining town, that's what's left of it, Bodie, that's on the other side yeah. of Yosemite. Right, <laughs> All right. that's left of the town is what didn't burn down after the, they finally, you know, left town and the right. little kid knocked a candle over and boom, right. there went the town. <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, some of these, so when I did my research, I would, I spent a lot of time on Highway 49 going to all the different 
little towns up and down the river. And so many of them would have, the ones that were still around, would have this in the center part of the town. I think you can still see this in Colombia down in the Southern Mines. Um, they would have a row of buckets and mm -hmm. the buckets would always be filled with water. And I'd be like, oh, like that's gonna do anything, these little buckets, you know? I mean, I don't know, maybe if it was a small fire, but a lot of towns figured that was the best solution because it was their only sort of, um, you know, hope to stop the fires, having this like bucket brigade situation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah um, the, the, it's just any kind of fire in an old town. And my dad being a fireman, they used to still do bucket brigades all the time. All the right. firemen get together. Is he, <laughs> is he in a firefighter in Madeira? Yeah, and then he ended up working for Cal Fire afterwards, so. Oh, bravo. Cal Fire mm -hmm. saved our town. Thank you, Cal Fire. <laughs> yeah, they did. They're those guys. No, all of them. It's it's really, it's intense. And then I think, too, is the... And the, women, the I should fire. say, those women, because there are Cal Yeah, Fire there are a lot of women now. Pretty amazing. Are, they're firefighters as well. So, yeah. um, so... Uh, there was, I'm like, what else should we talk about? There's, I don't want to give away the ending. I mean, <laughs> there, there's a lot of, um, you know, you have the Californias helping her out, and she's like, you did, you, like I said, you brought in a lot of that history. Should um, I stop sharing my screen? Oh, yeah, let's stop sharing the screen. Then we'll... Okay. Is that better? Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, cool. now I, I can, can read a little bit if you want me to. Or, hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. You were gonna read a section, so you yeah. read a little little bit out of it, and then um, we can talk about what you read. Too, so. Okay, and also I just want to say, so like you're recording this, right? So we don't have to like if if um nobody has any answers to the question now, you can put it online and um about who is the most interesting woman that you can think of in the West, and we can go with the answers online if you want. We don't have to do it live. Oh, oh, here, Barbara Falvin, here, let me unmute oh. you, Barbara. <laughs> uh, thank you, Franklin. So I did not want to use the, the internet because uh, I think that's cheating. Okay. <laughs> so I've, done, I've been thinking this whole time if I could come up with another name. So I did, but I don't know if she's too late for, you know, for you. So feel free to, to not allow me to use her if you'd like. But okay. I came up with Elma Spreckles. She was born, mm -hmm. I, I looked up Elma and she was born in 1881. So, and she, she was married to a very powerful man, of course, somebody Spreckles who had yeah. the sugar mining thing, but yeah. she's, she's, I mean, the sugar plantations and mm -hmm. the sugar processing, but she's considered the mother of San Francisco. She was a huge philanthropist. She actually gave, um, I guess, um, the Palace of, you know, uh, very important museums. And I think Coit Tower was Alma Spreckles too. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, I don't know if she counts or not because she's not from the gold rush era. Right. But I did, like I said, I did not want to use, I didn't want to cheat. I didn't want to use the, uh, the internet on it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's good. And that's early West. I'll mm -hmm. go with that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And you know, another thing I'd say, uh, just while um, I'm unmuted, is I was at the um, California Museum in Oak, the Oakland Museum of California yesterday. So beautiful. Which so beautiful. had, was an incredible resource for California history. And I just highly recommend it to all of our listeners as, uh, you know, because it has both um, amazing art pieces that were done by California artists. Everyone in there is a California, you know, is a California artist. So it goes back to these, you know, pristine times when Bierstadt came and made those huge paintings for, to advertise the railroad, you know, and to get people out here. Um, and also it shows um, the whole process of gold mining and, you know, the hydraulic mining that you're referring to that caused so much uh, environmental damage and stuff. Mm -hmm. But right. uh, I just, it's, it's a great resource, you know, everybody should get over there at least once. Thank you. Yes, Barbara, thanks for mentioning that. It's one of my favorite places because the paintings are just extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary there. I, I love I love that museum. Yeah. So okay, well, um let's let's work on having you give me your address so I can Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll get that to you. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So I guess I'll just read like two pages and I'll, I yeah. was I was kind of going back and forth about what I should uh, read. And then I was like, I think I'm just going to read the first two pages. Mm -hmm. 
actually there's an there's an um an an epilogue but i'm not going to read that or a prologue but i'm not going to read that i'm going to read chapter one okay so ready i'm going to go ahead and read mm -hmm. elizabeth counted the stitches holding together their dingy canvas tent twice she got 946 both times Cooped up in the midday heat, she seethed at Nate for leaving her alone. They'd lost too much time already. Refusing to wait another goddamn minute on this frittering and scheming, she untied the tent flaps and crawled out, stretching her arms long overhead. A soft air of relief touched her cheeks. Aching with hunger, she stumbled downriver in the direction of Coloma Town. She hadn't eaten since a bite of beans for breakfast the day before. Nate had left early that morning, again, gone digging for gold in the river, refusing to let her join, telling her to stay put, warning about unsavory men roaming around, men with a mind to take what they will. Elizabeth was done waiting on him to bring her something decent to eat. She grabbed her satchel and headed for the river trail, thinking on how she'd get food in her belly with no money left. She wasn't thinking about the roaming men, but about the blisters on her feet still burning something awful from that long journey getting to the river. Elizabeth walked all afternoon alongside the American, roiling loud, cutting through the valley, tempting her, tempting Nate. Her eyes burned with the honest light, shining lush and vibrant through the narrow valley. The grass glowed golden along the river trail, and the rich green pines marched up the steep sides of the canyon, swaying alive and standing taller and fuller than the scraggly pitch pines back home in Concord. Warm air whooshed through the branches, spreading a sweet smell all around. Arriving in Coloma Town, Elizabeth picked her way through a mess of empty tents strewn haphazard. Plopping down on a log in the center of a town, she unlaced her boots to let her stocking feet breathe and witness the new beginnings. Industrious fellows buzzed around, hammering, building buildings with fresh hewn boards and siding and plank floors and shingled roofs, jabbering and rushing, heaving pails and shovels and pans and timber, haggling for food and supplies. No women milled about and she wondered if they were all hiding away too. Some of the fellows in town noticed her sitting alone on the log. One man dropped his hammer and walked over, stammering and stuttering as if he hadn't seen a woman in years. She smiled polite, introducing herself as Mrs. Nathaniel Parker. More men came and more until over a dozen stood around gawking at the only woman in Coloma town. She pulled at her dress collar. She shifted her bottom on the log, cleared her throat, when a few of the men sat down in the crisped up grass like they had all the time to waste, she wondered why, but she didn't dare to ask. A fellow with a long curly beard dripping down his chin offered her a cup of cool river water. She took it, gulping. Wiping her cheek with the back of her hand, she reddened with shame. When one man tossed two bits into her empty cup, she looked at him coolly, thinking him daft. When another coin clinked into the cup, then another, she didn't give them back. Didn't look at the coins either. She simply stared up the clear sky, fanning herself with her shabby straw hat, acting like she couldn't care less if those foolish men wanted to waste good money just to sit near a woman looking not exactly pretty. I think what, what for a lot of us nowadays, we, we sort of, I don't want to say put that, um, that dread that we have for women on. So you think, oh, something bad is going to happen. Right. And, and then when I first started, I'm like, oh, something bad. But then I remember, no, the people were a lot more gentle back then, a lot more. I mean, there's some some things that were not the greatest, but. I mean, I she think, is a white woman, right? Yeah. And, and She's it's, not a Native American woman. That would have might have been quite a different story. Yeah. And that that's, I think there, um, but I think it's just nowadays we have just this really different um, people, I don't know, I guess the dread of the modern era <laughs> that right. you have in your head when you're reading about something that happened back in the past. And it's it's like, true. Like you put your sensibility of what we see in CNN and all the stuff about women dis being disappeared and you say, oh, well, she's out there alone. She would have been kidnapped or raped or it's like, well, not, not usually in a town like this, other men would have stepped in and mm -hmm. did, have done something, right? So, um, and I think she... It what that wasn't on her mind. It was on her husband's mind, but he didn't quite get that. That sort of the dynamic in the very beginnings of California with Americans arriving. Yeah, and, it's true. And women it's getting it's rights, and we had no no other state was giving these women rights. Mm -hmm. 
So it's but it's found- too, a lot of married men who left to come to get the fortunes, hopefully, like her father, like her father who had originally come to California um, with the intent of, you know, well, we think he the, the intent to, you know, send money back home or get rich to bring back and, and save the family. But it, it turns out it's a different, um, <laughs> differently for, for Elizabeth than, than he, since she suspected. But right. I think that that's, you know, one of the big things that's like when you have to step back into history when it was was a little different and like we said when you look at the history of the way a lot of the gold mining towns were that um the men there's a lot of good men versus the bad ones yeah and when something bad happens um well we're california we were known for our vigilante justice back then too right (laughs) well that that is true right i'm and maybe that's why women were um, there wasn't as much maybe violence against women, like it was very quick justice. But um, but I, I want to talk a little, if I could, just a little bit more about mm-hmm. the Mexicans and the Spanish and the California culture. Mm-hmm. I think that um, that a lot of people say, oh, well, the Hispanic culture, you know, they don't really value women or as much as Americans. And I, I don't, I don't really, that doesn't totally resonate with me because I understand the history of Californios and what they gave to women in California in terms of rights. And I think, um, so I don't know that I just want to touch on that because I think that that's no, important. It's important because California also had under the, under Mexican rule had public education, which wasn't a normal American thing. We think it was an American thing, but it really wasn't. It wasn't, right. a, it's a, that was part of normal society in, in California was public education. And that was something that got brought into the United States from the Californios and the people who, you know, helped to, who were here settled a long time before um, this, the Mexican-American War, so. Right, which we, which was a very sophisticated culture. Mm-hmm. Um, the Spanish and later the Mexicans, um, very vibrant, family-oriented, um, very wealthy, um, you know, filled with music and art and um, value for um, spending time together. And I think a lot of California uh, sort of culture can be derived from that, obviously, but but in terms of women, we have that culture and those laws to thank for um, giving our us rights. And I, I do also want to just speak about one more thing. There's, you know, we still have, the rights have been given to women, even in most recent, um, in the last five years, we were given rights to run our own health care for our own bodies, and that's also in the Constitution. So I have to believe that, you know, it began in 1850, and it's still, women are still valued today the way we were valued back then. So we have them to thank, the Californios. Well, too, it's like I forgot in the presentation, you had a picture of, of Mexico's last governor, Pio Pico and his daughters. Pio Pico, yeah. <laughs> Actually, his daughters and his niece, I think. It, I don't think they're all his daughters. No, yeah. I don't think they're all his daughters either, but... Yeah, the people, last governor, know. the last governor under Mexican rule. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, there are a lot of streets in down Southern California named Pio Pico. I don't know how many are up here, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, I see. It's such a pleasure talking to someone who really appreciates California history and California culture. I can't tell you. It's well, I yeah, it's, well, that's, it's I could just talk forever it's, about it's it. It's exciting because it, there's a lot of people like we, we talked about. There's a huge gap of. of our state's history that just sort of gets glazed over. And when you right. start to do the research and start to, I mean, every town in California has a story and a history. And um, even like my hometown, the, the, um, which was the county was part of Fresno County. Um, and then it split off and became its own county. Um, so there, it's just how, and that was in the 1890s. And so there's all these different stories in their past. And, and there's so many little ghost towns are towns that are, have been forgotten over time just mm-hmm. because Californians moved away from either for the railroad, for lumber, for different industries that some towns were completely abandoned. And now there's just some, a little like, like Borden, which is outside of Madeira, which used to be a really healthy, vibrant town. But when the lumber mill decided they were going to put it in Madeira, Borden pretty much died because there was yeah. no more industry. It went somewhere else. So, and now there's right. just a little sign on the highway that says Borden. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I mean, my, so my novel takes place on the American River, mm-hmm. the North Fork of the American, and also in Nevada City, which I call uh, Manzanita City. And the reason why I don't call it 
um, Nevada city is because people outside of California would, in my opinion, would have thought that was Nevada. Mm -hmm. So I renamed it, but, um, yeah, I mean, at the time in 1851, 1852, Nevada city had more people than any city in, um, California. Mm -hmm. So now it's just a tiny little town. So yeah, people, yeah. people moved away. So if you have it, I, I encourage everybody to, to get a copy. We do have one in the library, but you can, um, when I send out a follow-up email, I have a link to where you can purchase this. It, like I said, it's a great read. And if you're not, if you're new to California history, this is a great way to get into it. Because <laughs> um, you really do, like I said, you really do interweave that history into the story. And especially during the 1850s. And, you know, people love the gold rush, but so much came out of it and so much of the inter twine with the, the older history of the state and um, the people who were coming west. Um, you know, the, the mixing of the, the two cultures and the, and the Native American cultures as well. So um, I, I like, I really did love this. I, I could see why it won so many awards, Wendy. And thank I just want to so thank much. you for joining us today. And um, and I'm, yeah, one day we'll meet in person. Yeah, and uh, definitely. Off my, tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Because <laughs> my husband's family is from Larkspur. So San Francisco and Larkspur. So I, I, we come back all the time. So I'll definitely. Yeah, it was, that was what I really loved that you, when we were first talking that you have this connection to Larkspur as well. Yeah, yeah. So My husband there. actually has the key to Larkspur. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, another story. That's a story for another time. <laughs> anyway. Um, so well, before you go, what are you, what are you working on now? Are you working on another book or are you? Um, yeah, you know, I've got two things, two threads kind of going. One is I'm very fascinated with the San Francisco um sort of the artist salons in the 20s that mm -hmm. women were involved in. And um, in down in Monterey, you know, the artist colonies, that that narrative is super interesting to me, that history, so vibrant. And I have some family members that were involved um, in that whole movement, some painters in my family. So I'm really interested in that. And I'm sort of working on a novel surrounding those things. Yeah, and all, I also, <laughs> yeah, do you think so? Yeah, well, no, I just think about all the Mexican artists too who came up in the 30s. That were, you know, and, you know, Frida Kahlo came to California to visit. I mean, there's so many artists yeah. that have come to. Yeah, Diego area, Rivera. So. And yeah, mm -hmm. that's why they came, right? It was such an interesting time to be in California with the art. So, yeah. And then I also am working on another nonfiction book um, about technology. So, yeah. Well, keep us posted. I can't wait to see. And this was your first book, right? Just, it was my first novel. Yeah. first novel, so. My, my mother-in-law thinks we should have a sequel, but I'm like. I don't know. Well, I mean, you, you, if you've done enough research on California, you could do pretty much another book on a totally different topic than another part yeah. of the state and, and still have, there's so much to write about. I think too, so much history to cover in different parts of the state. Yeah, well, I so. would love to um, to see some stories from Native American women, mm -hmm. you know, about, about Native American history in California and also um, more women of Hispanic descent, you know, Mexican, Span Spanish families that have been here. I'd love to see some writers you know, some women writers, you know, take on those roles. Mm -hmm. So I'll be oh. cheering for them. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll looking forward to these next books. Keep, and then, like I said, when, one day when we can all meet in person again, we'll have you down um, and we'll have you do a book signing in person where people can get, um, Barbara says, yes, the sequel would be fun too. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, Barbara, you have to give me your address. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give Barbara's address to you, and then. Okay. Um, but thank you, everybody, for for coming today. Yeah, and then, thank you um, for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm gonna go see if I can rouse the bear. Yeah, so you'll be safe too, and thank you for joining us, and and we'll see you again. So okay, all right, bye. Bye.